thing. All right. Good morning, everybody. I had posted earlier and said that I was threatening on doing another live feed this morning. It's going to be an impromptu off the hip one. And this morning we're in the armorer shop here at Ghost of the Battlefield. And I'm here with one of our volunteers, Sebastian, or as he goes by, Zeb. Seb, yes. Seb, yes. Seb. I always put a Z in that. I don't know why. Yeah, people do. People do. That sounds better. <laughs> Zeb. It's like the cleaning agent, right? It's, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, this morning we are going to talk about the M1 carbine and cleaning, maintenance, and if it needs be restoration of said such. Um, the M1 carbine for me is one of my favorite weapons. It's the first gun I ever purchased. Actually, the second gun I ever purchased. First one I ever fired. Uh, I got one for a high school graduation present, actually, when I graduated high school not too long ago. And, um, <laughs> and uh, is one of the... Sweetest guns to shoot, particularly for smaller people, uh, for girlfriends, for kids. It has very little recoil. Um, we used to say that it was the uh, small gun with a big bark. It, it does have a rather loud report, but it is fun. Um, background on the M1 carbine, of course, made for World War II. It was uh, used primarily as a second-line weapon for persons who were not going to be on the front lines. They uh, would be issued to clerks and cooks and truck drivers and um, who, who else? Mortarmen, machine gunners, officers. They were uh, used a lot by the airborne because they were so light and they folded up. And this is an all around robust gun. So a lot of guys would end up carrying it anyway. Um, of course, in World War II, most combat took place at less than 21 feet away. It was only seven yards, or seven yards was the average engagement zone. If you're in a city oh, yeah. or a Absolutely. scrub brush, you're surprised by the enemy. Um, this gun had a 15 round magazine, so it did tend to provide a lot of fi uh, lay down firepower. Not necessarily for long range shooting at all, my stretch of the imagination. But it was, um, you know, in my humble opinion, it was, it was kind of the, the progeny of the current M16, because it was small, lightweight, used a sub-caliber, small, not a battle rifle munition. And, um, you know, it was uh, innovative for its time. It was the only, only real weapon of its kind. And, you know, we were talking about anyone else that had something similar. Yeah, like a, a smaller caliber semi-automatic carbine. No, I can't think no, of anybody that was... Nobody. Uh, None I can think of. Um, it was very it was a unique. It was neat to the U.S. Um, the Germans did like to pick them up a lot. Anyone who found one picked it up, usually captured it. It was it was well liked, and it's particularly for me. It's for the size. I mean, you can carry a twelve pound M1 Garand, or you can carry this little six pound puppy, and it doesn't hurt the back. But um, made on mass in the United States by seven or eight different manufacturers. Everyone from typewriter companies, jukebox companies, uh, postal scale companies, transmission companies. GM made them. Made the most of them. It was made by GM. Uh, Winchester made them. And uh, let me think, all the ones I think of, Saginaw Steering Gear Company, Irwin Peterson, uh, Standard Products, Rockola, Rockola yep. is a big one, National Poster Meter, I never had a poster meter, and um, there's quite a few others. All of the subcomponents were made by those companies and a myriad of other companies. The, what makes, what stands American firepower in World War II out from all the other countries is the interchangeability of parts with your K98s. All the other bolt action rifles, Japanese rifles, the parts are all pretty much made for the rifle. There was some interchangeability once you take away your headspace out of that. But 
you could literally break a spring on a carbine, go down to the armor, pick up the spring, slap it in, and you're good to go. Uh, interchangeability, ease of maintenance, and reliability. It was a very, very reliable gun. It features a direct blowback gas system, so there's very little to go wrong. Um, there are some people that complain about its stopping power. And what, I mean, I hear the stories of, you know, Korea, in Korea, them shooting Koreans carrying, you know, wearing like five layers of jackets and stopping mm -hmm. the bullet. I, I don't, I don't believe it. But that having been said, we're going to get into this thing here a little bit. Now, in the frame here, you see the M1A1 paratrooper carbine. And then you see a regular carbine. It is a later war one. It is a type two stock. It's not a fat belly, but it's not a high wood either. It's a very nice piece, actually. This one is here in the armor shop for restoration and cleaning. And it has already been stripped down to the point where um, we can start putting it back together and we'll go through each little system and how to take care of it. So putting the wood aside for now, I'm gonna go into a lot into wood later about how to take care of that, you know, well. So I straddle the camera strap here. <laughs> So here we have the main action of the M1. You see this one has had the bayonet lug added to the end. You see the barrel date on this one. I don't have my glasses, so this is going to be a challenge. I can't see it. It's a Winchester barrel, though. Yeah, looks like it's got an N on there. Right? Yeah, that's a W, actually, because oh. I think this is a Winchester. This is a Winchester. Well, that's why it has a W barrel. Makes sense then, doesn't it? Okay, so all one piece. It is, like I said before, a gas blowback weapon. And right here on the bottom is what makes the whole gun go. Oh, I really need my glasses. I'm looking at a blur. No, but there's a bit. Hey, there we are. Okay, great. So on the bottom is the gas piston. And you can tell if it's good to go or not by it should f move freely when I turn it upside down. There you go. And I can move it in and out with my fingers. So to clean and maintenance this weapon effectively, here's the points I always look at. You see some schmutz right here, actually. Um, what I always look for is, of course, active rust. And then the main spring rides in this channel right here on the side of the receiver. And I get rust forming down inside of here. That's one of the big things. I took one of these to a, an event uh, a few weeks ago. And someone asked to see the inside and I pulled it apart. It shot rust out of it. Most embarrassing. The barrels are easy to rebarrel. We have the tools here. You'll notice in the bottom there is a timing notch, which allows you to swap out barrels relatively effectively. As long as you have a no-go gauge, you're good. There's some proof marks there. So I am going to hand this gun back to Zeb here, who is going to spray this down and get the schmutz off of it. And we'll go into that whole thing here a little bit later. The next piece to look at is your bolt. This one is the correct flat top bolt for this year. Typically speaking, most of the World War II guns will have this style bolt in it. The flat top was indicative of World War II production. And I'm trying to desperately look for a round bolt that we don't have. Um, if you have a gun made during World War II, you're going to see this flat top. Like that, this dished out spot on the top. The, um, the M1 evolved into the M2 carbine at one point. And it, uh, what, what they did was... They beefed up the bolt by just making it round all the way. Also removed a machining process in it, made it a little bit easier to make. But this would be round on the top if you had an M2 bolt. Now the M2 parts are completely interchangeable with the M1 parts. They were designed that way. So the M2, of course, looks identical to the M1 carbine. The only difference is a small uh, selector switch on the side that delineated between semi-automatic and full automatic fire. Of course, the M2... The fire, the rate of fire in it was extremely high, somewhere around 700 rounds a minute. If you've ever seen the video of it, it it's it's nasty. And so they developed a 30 round magazine to go along with it to uh, add to your trigger time. But the M2 carbine is a whole other thing. Of course, don't attempt to get one of those unless it is a properly NFA stamped gun with the paperwork. So we're gonna look at our bolt here. I'm trying to knock over the light. We're gonna look at the extractor and make sure it has. That nice little lip on it right there. Sometimes these crack off and you don't ever even see it. The contour will just be wrong. And we get guys coming to shop all the time. This one extract and one extract. Well, that's why it's just one little piece right here. Um, to take this apart is extremely laborious. You need actually, it helps if you have a tool that compresses this whole thing that allows you to pop this out. This one is luckily for us good. The bolt face is not marred or have any. Uh, strations on it 
so that's good and clean. You want to look under this extractor here for a, do you have a flashlight? Yes, I do. need a flashlight. You want to look under this. Oh, perfect. You want to look under there. There is some dirt under there. Okay. That's now we're going to take care of that in a second. But uh, what will happen is brass will build up under there and just like the M16 will cause it to foul eventually. The bolt, uh, the firing pin itself should be free and moving. And you can actuate it by this spot right here. And it's sticky, but it is okay. So there you go. See, firing pin functional. And he's still working on cleaning that action up. So I'm gonna hand this back to him too. And he's gonna clean that off for me. And then we're gonna look at the trigger group here. Okay, so the trigger group is how you can quickly look at an M1 carbine and say, is this World War II correct? Is it not World War II correct? And that primarily is based upon these two pieces right here. This is your magazine release, the M on it for magazine, makes sense. And your safety selector switch. Now here's the difference between World War II and non-World War II ones. Oh, I'm trying to do this left-handed. This is a serious problem. On early World War II ones, the button was not a rotator. It was a snap button, which would work like that. The magazine release button does not have M stamped on it. It's just smooth, and there's no knurling or um, strations on it, no markings. So if you look at it quickly, you can say, okay, this is definitely a World War II trigger group because it has... The push button safety and the smooth magazine injection uh, magazine uh, switch so the problem with these is gi's tended to ride with their finger on here and you could inadvertently put it on safe without knowing it or if you're left-handed inadvertently put it on fire without knowing it so right now it's on safe i'm right-handed this is my right hand yes i'm not having good trigger discipline here if my finger's riding on the outside of this sucker, I can inadvertently go say, go hot with it. So what they did is for a little bit of tactile reinforcement, they went ahead and added this rotator switch. It was also a little beefier. And that way with your finger, you can very clearly feel safe, safe, and hot. A little easier to delineate between just as a button up or down. So, that having been said, there are, I believe there are four different trigger housings. The differences are minor. Typically, it comes down to the machining marks on the sides, the cutouts, the dishes. As things tend to go later into the war, things got easier to make. So, they would like not necessarily have this machined mark right here, it was just all one space. Um, the back of it was less intricate. The hammer got more and more simplified with less markings and indentations and machining marks in it. Um, if you have ever had to disassemble this, Seb, <laughs> you'll know that putting this trigger together is a pain in the butt. So you'll see in here, there's the spring is in that little hole. And the two pins hold the fire, fire control grip together, kind of like the M16. And then down here are these push pins with springs in them, or um, not push pins, they're... Uh, Oh, help me. Detents. Thank yep. you. Detents. Yes. Detents that ride against this, that give it its spring tension. And then the same thing here is another push pin or a detent going the wrong way or going the back way that acts as a cam on here. So it's the same situation. They didn't change that up at all. It just rotates. This, this shaft on the safety is different than the one that's on the push button. But learning from the process, learning from field experience, they just made small, minor, minor changes that just made things a little more user friendly. So that is the trigger group. And he's already cleaned that, so you don't have to clean that again. All right, he's handing me about the bolt, which means he's done with it. So we're gonna take a look under here and we're gonna inspect this sucker. Uh, I don't know. Ah, look at it. Underneath that extractor, look at that dirt under there. Yep, Get that you. out of there. Oh, yep, yep, your weekend pass is canceled. Mm -hmm. All right, so. Here you have your op rod. This is the correct World War II earlier one, and you can tell by the front of the catch right here is flat. It's not hooked. I don't think I have a hooked one here to show. Nope, nope. Well, we have all early stuff today. How is this possible? Usually it's you got the World War II or the Korean War ones and the Vietnam ones and the one ones. 
All right, so anyway, Operod, um, not a type one, probably a type two or three. Again, you can see the machining processes here on the side, a sharp prod. Oh, by the way, um, for those of you who don't know, I don't, I can't see if, please ask questions, ask all the questions you want. That's why I'm here. And if you feel like supporting us, you can also hit the stars button. That's something new Facebook is doing where I think every star we get a penny or something like that. We just started doing that last night. But what happens is I had this bar across my screen and I can't see the comments very well. So if you comment, please make it a big question so I can see it. And I will definitely answer any questions anyone has. See, like, again, someone just said something. I can't see it. I don't know how that keeps... See, it's just like there's nothing... Yeah, I don't get that. Anyway, um, at the end of this, we'll go over to the computer and we'll look at it and see everything. So hang in there. We'll answer your question again. This is, again, this is a very nice carbine, a very nice Winchester. You can see down in here... See the W? Anyone see the W? Give me a thumbs up, someone. See the W. There you go. Thank you, whoever that was. So the W, again, stands for Winchester. This appears so far as I can tell to be an all-matching Winchester. Now, that having been said, in this humble historian's opinion, actually, I should change the name of the page to the humble historian. In this, in this humble historian's page, uh, DM, um, that never really happened. I mean, it, I'm sure it did, but you know, the exception is, is is a lot more common than the rule in this in this case. You had six or seven companies cranking these things out. You had 35 to well, probably more than that, 65 or so subcontractors, and you had all these people trying to um, to make these parts. Well, you know, standard products would call Brock Ola and say, hey, we have, you know, 5,000 slides, but we need, you know, 6,000 up rods or 6,000 main trigger springs or something like that. And they'd swap parts. So you would get guns coming directly to the field that would not be matching. So if you get a carbine, if you're in the market for a carbine, you go out there and you get one and it's not all matching, don't cry the blues. It is perfectly normal to see that. If you want to spend the time getting on eBay, overpaying for the parts, and um, swapping them out until you get the perfect gun, by all means, do it. I mean, not that I haven't done that before. <clears throat> yeah, right. So, anyway, Winchester op rod, very nice. This doesn't, oh, nope, we got dirt in here, so we're going to hand that right, back now. Gotcha. Let's inspect that bolt, folks, and see if his weekend pass is reinstated. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, much better. Now you can see, you can see clearly... That lip right there. Okay, everyone's giving you a thumbs up, Seb. You didn't give you a pass it's inspection easy, on this. It's easy for you to see when you have my pen light. <laughs> oh, is this yours? Yes. Too bad. That's unfortunate. Okay, so the carbine came with a couple accessories that helped it operate. One of the interesting ones is it came with an oil bottle, and the oil bottle is what held the sling on, not on the M1 carbine, M1A1 paratrooper carbine because it had a sling swivel on the bottom that acted as the rear part of the sling attachment, but it actually fit into the buttstock right here. And that's how you wrap your sling around. Now, for those of you who don't know, putting the sling in is kind of difficult yeah. if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you can sit there and fumble with that sucker all day long and realize, oh, you have to take one side of the sling out and we'll do this later. And I'll probably screw it up and everyone will laugh at me. But that is the oil bottle. Um, no unit markings on this one. They still make these things today. Let's look at the butt plate. Oh, rusty butt plate. Your weekend pass is canceled again. All right, so stamped butt plate. They didn't really change much during the war. We'll clean that when we do this dog. All right, so how's that upper coming? It's going. Oh, it's right here in my hand. Okay, yep. well, let's take a look here. So like we talked about, if you don't have the tool for this, don't sweat it. There is a specific wrench that removes this and as you can see someone oh, i'm sorry as you can see now someone tried to remove this without the tool and they kind of boogered it up a little bit you see the, the the chew marks on the side there where someone has probably put a screwdriver in there and tried to knock it loose if you don't have the tool don't try to take it out because you're gonna mess it up go on ebay get the tool they still make them it looks like a little wrench i tried finding it this morning to show everyone but again it's gone missing Luckily for us, we don't need to do this when we blew it out earlier with air. So this one is good. So we're turning it upside down. Give it a little shake in there. It's sliding out. Yeah. There. So this should move back and forth very freely. As you can see, it's moving really good. Um, if this is to, well, for those of you who know the function of the weapon, the round is going to be sitting in the chamber, which is right here. 
when it fires, it goes out the barrel. There's a cut right in here, a little hole drilled that goes down into this little reservoir and the gas, you know, the explosive powders of the round firing, fill up this little reservoir and push this piston back. That piston hits against the inside of the op rod and gives it its very distinctive ping, ping, ping sound. So when you fire this gun, if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you hear, um, you hear what was that crazy coked out guy? Um, Tom Sizemore. Mm. You hear Tom Sizemore laying waste on the, on the Krauts with his M1 carbine. You hear ping, 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 ping. That gives it that very distinct sound. As you can see right there, see that shiny spot? I move my light like that. There. That's right where the piston hits. Okay. So again, ping, ping, ping. And this, this sits on this channel here and drives this back, right? Ping, 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 ping. And this little hook up here is attached to the bolt. And we'll get into all this in a second here, but we're still doing the cleaning. And that's what allows the weapon to function. So one thing you want to take a look at is your main spring. Um, you usually will get rust on the end of this sucker. I don't see any, which is good. I ain't gonna worry about that one right now. And then there is your uh, main spring guide, which looks like a big needle right there. And that is gonna sit, wow, try, try, try doing this. <laughs> I had no sense of depth perceptions. I was like, it's right there. It's right here, ha, <laughs> come back here, come over here. All right, fill up my finger, there it is. That's gonna go in there and that slides down on that. Okay, so that's one piece. All right, so we're gonna put the action of it back together and there's a little bit of fumbling around with this. So bear with me. You're going to take the gun, or the action, sorry, and you're going to find your bolt that you can't see because you're blind. And there it is. And you're going to take that little hook right there, the firing pin, and get it over this lip. Again, I have no depth perception. It's a terrible. All right. And you're going to get in that track. All right. And then you're going to put it, wiggle it down on in there. I can't see. I can't see. There you go. Ta-da! And look, it's fixed. It's movie magic. Movie magic. Movie <laughs> magic. I like that. All right, so Seb, you're going to hold that for me right there. Gotcha. And then we're going to take our op rod, and there is a little notch right here. See it right there? And then on the bottom of the barrel is a notch, a corresponding notch right there. Okay? And we're going to do some movie magic again here. <laughs> now, when you do this, make sure you get this hooked on, hooked on here. It sits right in that track right there, okay? So, movie magic time. Okay. Movie magic. There it is. All right. So, now we can see that function. And that sticker's not on the track. But that's good demonstration. So, you see this little notch right here on the op rod. Now, in my experience, and particularly in the cold with these things, we took them up to Indian Town Gap where it was negative 20 degrees the parts can shrink ever so slightly and that can pop out particularly if the little notch on the bottom of this is worn down so back here there is another notch or two notches actually and then a corresponding divot right there see it Does everybody see it corresponding divot same thing it's for this bolt hold open you're going to pull it back and we're going to put it this way so you can see it come into place boom everybody see that make sure that this is locked in there because you can still kind of make a function without it being in there but you don't want that to happen. So you're gonna pull it back until this click in there. And I'm gonna get my fingers out of the way before I smash them. And we're gonna hold it right there. So now, remember I'm talking about that action of the weapon, okay? And of course it came undone. You are being pain. For anyone at home, try doing this with no depth. Uh, movie magic time. All right. Death no depth <laughs> reception. All right, there we go. <laughs> we're back in there. Okay. All right, so remember we were talking about that action of the gun, okay? So here is the chamber, like we showed before. The round is in here, it fires, boom. It starts traveling down the barrel. That little reservoir of gas and the hole is down here, fills it up, pushes this back. I, actually, I can actually make the ping sound. See? So that's the action of the gun. Very simple, very robust. Look in here, you can see, see the light coming through? Not, not very 
high tolerance, okay? That is essential for ease of function. Sand could travel through that hole, dirt could travel through that hole. It's not gonna jam the weapon, at least in most instances. I mean, I'm sure you can get enough sand in there to jam it. But you can see that light coming through. It's not extremely precision engineering. So we're gonna hold the gun like this and then we're gonna put the trigger group back on. The front has a hole in it and the back has a tooth or a notch and we're gonna put that notch in first. It's gonna fit in there and we can see up there in the corner. And then that front, again, no depth perception. And this is pretty tight and it's gonna stick over there. Yeah, I know. Depth perception, movie magic time. And I need a little, Just yeah, just clobber it little, with yeah, let's clobber it with this. That's a great idea. Okay. Yep. Maybe magic complete. The lower is now on. The trigger, the trigger assembly is now on the bottom of the gun. And you'll see that this whole line up for me right there is now lined up. And I take the pin from trusty assistant and the pin. Oh man, no deficit. <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> hard to do. <sighs> okay. Feel for it. Feel for the hole. No comments. All right. Something yep. to whack it with. Oh, uh, yep. Here, there's the uh, trusty. The trusty uh, whacker. All right, here we go. We're back in. All right, so we're gonna put all this to the side for a minute, all the way to the side. We're gonna talk about um, we're gonna talk about the wood here for a second. So, talking about wood, Saturday morning wood. This is a very nice stock. It, it does have its original markings right here. Again, depth perception issues. And the IH right there in the inlet indicates inland made, which is okay for a Winchester. Nice walnut stock, good condition. Um, if this were a post-World War II carving stock, there would be a large lump right here, and that's for a better purchase on the front of the gun. That's for the full automatic versions. This is a Type 2 stock. It has the cutout in the side for the op rod on the Type 1s. It came back straight to call high woods came back straight and then nutched down there, but they always broke off. So they said, hey, you know what? It keeps breaking off. Let's just cut it off. No point in having it there. So stocks. All right, so in armorers or in the armories or in the manufacturers of these things, what they would do is these stocks came off of a large machine that copied it. They had a blank and then they had a master key and then they chewed out like, you know, 50 of these at a time on a large machine. They came off of the machine completely raw. They went to sanding where they were sanded smooth. And then they went to a huge vat of boiled linseed oil that was just constantly churning. They put them in racks. And then the gun would be dropped in this rack of boiled linseed oil, allowed to sit for however long, and then came up on the machine and then dried by air as the oil dripped off. This stock has already been treated with the, with the linseed oil. And our formula for the linseed oil is a highly guarded secret. Um, it's not the straight linseed oil. It's got a whole bunch of other stuff in it. Quite typically speaking, the older it is, the nastier it is, the more stuff that's been added, uh, the better it is. You put it on there instead of letting it drip dry. We wipe it down after a little while so there's no excess oil and then give it you know, a few days to cure. So that having been said, what the military would do next is they would take the stocks and the hand guards, where is the hand guard? And the hand guard. You can see this is an early hand guard. It's got the two holes instead of four. All right, in the middle lip on the back. They would take the wood components. They would take the wood components and they would, again, put them in a large vat of paraffin wax. That was heated. It was heated at this point. And, you know, it would dunk into this wax machine and then again, pull up, it would drip dry. And then they probably had some kind of large buffer wheel. I'd imagine some guy who's standing there probably all day just buffing, buffing the stocks back and forth on a, on a wheel. We obviously don't have a 500 gallon vat of yeah. boiling <laughs> paraffin wax, which would, which would be rather concerning. Maybe you Great for hair removal. <laughs> oh, maybe I don't. Okay, so what we have done is here at the store, we actually invented our own. So this is what we colloquially, 
How do you sell that one? Cool. To, to look, to look. Well, now you, yeah, you're anyway, it it's known as really we call it. We call it boomstick butter. It's got some other less <laughs> wonderful names around here, which I'm not going to go into telling anybody. But anyway, so here is our copy of that wax, and we actually sell this stuff. By the way, I have to make a whole new batch of it, and I'll list a link to it online eventually. Um, but it has a wonderful aroma. It smells very piney. I don't think like kind of like pine tree ish. It's nice. It's, it's not. It's not. Put it this way: if you bust this out on the living room table while you're cleaning your gun, your wife's not gonna be too pissed. <laughs> I mean, she could be a little pissed, but it, it's got a good, a good, you know, kind of Christmassy smell. Yeah, I'll go with Christmassy smell. So anyway, we're gonna have to pull some movie magic here. But um, what you're gonna want to do is, well, there's there's two ways of doing this. We have two argumentative ways of doing this. You can heat this up. Um, you can put it in like a pot of warm water, or we can bust out our hair dryer and uh, do some time lapse here. Hair dryer, and let's plug this in over here real quick. Yep. Yeah, I also fumble fingers. I, I, you know, I don't. I don't typically fumble the the reassembly, but I have. I'm looking through. Bifocals on a screen while straddling a camera rig while holding it in front of me, so it's, yeah, no depth perception whatsoever. All right, so we're gonna heat this up a little bit. With Seb's wonderful heat gun, which I think is nothing more than a hairdryer. All right, and we're pasty inside. See the, see it's gooey, ju ju juicy, juicy, gooshy? Ju the difference between juicy and gooey, <laughs> gooey, it's juicy. Anyway, um, I'm gonna get my fingers dirty here. Oh, that feels wonderful. And we're gonna start. <laughs> it's, like, it's like warm apple pie. <laughs> and we're gonna just start smearing it on here. Just get in all the cracks and crevices. Oh, this is lovely. And you're just gonna really get dirty with it. Just, just get in there, smash it into all the, all the little cracks. And movie magic, we're gonna hand it back to Zeb, who's gonna finish that for me while I figure out how to wipe my hands off on something. And uh, oh, we're good. And <laughs> so that whole thing. Real quick, while he is performing movie magic on the stock, just get it to where it's coated and stuff, and then we'll show him both. You know, we're going to talk about the other M1 carbines. This is the M1A carbine. Yes, this is a reproduction. Okay, I, you know we don't have the five thousand dollar real one, and. Being able to tell how this one is a imposter is very simple. If you look at the side, you'll see that whoever makes these, this is a very nice one. This is not a real one. You see how the side here has that dish out in it? On an original, this would have been machined out. It would have had a, a, a large drum router that would come down and go brrr, and ifs would be very sharp edges. This one, as you can tell, has just been sanded. So there's a divot in the side. And the purpose of the divot in the side is so when you fold it up, the back of this mag pouch here sat in that little notch, more or less, this thing should fold up. There you go. And it kind of held it in place. Now this carbine was made exclusively for the Airborne. They actually built a, where'd it go? My assistant ran off on me, typical. This carbine actually was um, built for the air, for the airborne. It folded up. It fit in a small little canvas bag, and you could use, you know, your hands would be, be free. You could put it in this little holster. It fold up, sit on the side of your musette bag or on your leg, and it provided a whole bunch of little firepower for you in a convenient small size. So that having been said the m1a1 carbine this this is actually remember i told you before that this was the gun that i bought for myself when i graduated high school not too not too horribly long ago this is actually it this is my carbine from high school it is an inland correct serial number range for a paratrooper it features all of the early style this one is remember i had said earlier don't worry about swapping all the parts and make it 100 percent matching oh well that's what i did with this one so don't do that but but look at this anyway you have the very early Type 1 rear sight. You have close and really close. Actually, no, that's that's close. That's really close. 
That's your two notches right there. Simple front sight, right? No bayonet lug, folks. Okay, bayonet lugs only came out in late 44. They are correct for World War II guns. They came out in late 44. If you look at the picture of the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima, which we're going to be covering in February, you'll see that the M1 Carby and the Highland Black is carrying has a bayonet lug on it. Um, no bayonet lug on these models. No bayonet lug previously until like 40, early 44. Again, we talked about the selector switches. They are push button instead of the rotator. Magazine is a, looks like a Sag SG, Saginaw steering gear made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the stock is the folding variety, which comes out and clicks. Um, these stocks were not well liked simply because you sneeze and it folds up. The barrel is original in this one and it is a, uh, someone help me here, I can't see it. <laughs> I really can't see it. General Motors Division, September of 43, which matches when the gun was made. It is an early six digit serial number, 752,000, which is set, obviously September of 1943. Has the buttstock mag pouch with extra magazines in there. So when you had this weapon, as it was, you were carrying 45 rounds of, mag of ammunition, not too shabby. Um, a lot of the guys would take the leg bag and they'd sew extra mag pouches to it to add more, more firepower on there. Um, the neat thing about the M1 carbine pouch or magazine is, where'd my assistant go? Sir. Can you, uh, um, there's gotta be up, up front, I think where the, can you find me an M1 Grand belt somewhere up front? Okay. I think there's one over there by the Marine in the corner. I'll just keep the camera. Right. The M1 magazine, it was about the size of a pack of cigarettes at the time. It was pretty small, handy. You could put them in your pocket. You could carry them in a jacket pocket. And they had these little nifty mag pouches that they could sew to just about anything. You'll see most of the carbines have the buttstock mag pouch. That was not ever meant to be a thing. It just happened to work out that way. And everyone says, oh no, they made the mag pouches for the buttstock. No, they didn't. Because if they made the bag pouches for the buttstock, why would they put a metal grommet in the back of it? This is designed to fit on the web belt. That's why there is a grommet right here. And if you notice on the web belt, there's a corresponding snap. That's why that works that way. And that's how it's made. So on the stock now we have our paraffin wax coating. Nice and sticky, smelling wonderful. And one thing you can do is look for the heat gun, which is now gone. Wow, just screwing up all over today. So you're gonna end up with this kind of texture to it. And then you're just gonna take a rag and just like you're polishing shoes, forget it. Um, you're just gonna start. And you'll feel it when it gives, just like you're polishing shoes, there's like resistance, resistance, and then just gives and it starts polishing. You see that sheen? See the sheen forming right there? There. Perfect. Look at that. See the sheen? You don't want it too shiny. You don't want to fly as a board. What this is going to do is it's going to lock the moisture into the stock. You don't want it too dry else it's going to get brittle and get dry rot over time. Move your magic boy. And you're going to polish that sucker for me. And you end up with a texture like this. See that sheen? That's about right. Not parade glossy, not parade, not not flat. But uh, this is another carbine that just happened to be sitting here. This one is a August of 43. So a very close compatriot to that one. Now this one has some of the post-war upgrades. We can talk about that for a moment while he's putting that back together or polishing that off. Post-war upgrades. Post-war upgrades included, or late-war upgrades included, a rear sight, which was now adjustable. You saw that they used this sight not only on this gun, but they used it on the 03, 03 A3, Smith & Crone 03 A3, the uh, later version of the ubiquitous Springfield 03. It was variable. It had a settings of 100, 200, 250, and 300 yards. So 300 yards with this gun is kind of laughable. Interesting note that this gun is dated, uh, has a lower serial number than the other one does, but yeah, a later date. Probably a different manufacturer. I just can't see the manufacturer. No, it's in England. How's that possible? Anyway. Right here, you'll note there is usually always a peen mark on the receiver right there. 
that delineates that is past gas proofing. So it is, you know, gonna hold up to the firing cartridges. This one still has the early, the early op rod and the flat bolt, but this does have what we talked about before. It has the bayonet lug on the front. See the difference being that one and that one. This, this, um, this was what allowed you to fit the, uh, the bayonet to the end of it. And the bayonet was essentially a copy of the trench knife, the M3 trench knife. And this, this gun here though is pretty much indicative of Vietnam. It's got a Vietnam air sling on it. It's got a nylon sling. So a little Marvin the Arvin going on. Are we done polishing? Do you full assistant? While we're waiting for that to happen, yeah. does anybody have any questions? Please post some questions up there. I can answer or talk about how uh, movie magic's working this thing over there. How are you watching the video at the same time? Is there another person named Sebastian on there? Uh, I guess. Oh, how about that? I can't see. <laughs> Sebastian Gerhard. Okay, we can talk about lubrication real quick because you know the world moves on lubrication. So here we have our assembled action. Here we have your op rod guide. Op rod spring spring and op rod guide right here. What I always tend to do with this, and remember the more lubrication you add, the gooier it's gonna get and the more dirt you can get stuck in there. I always tend to take a little bit of grease and I work it into the springs. Like I said, this is the only place really that humidity is gonna get stuck in that gun and really build up some rust. So a little coat of grease isn't gonna hurt anything. I'm gonna work it all the way along the uh, coils of the spring here as I throw the grease away. All right. Then we're gonna take this, hold the gun upside down. We're gonna find that little track on the bottom. And I know that this is already clean, at least a better be. And there's no dirt in the bottom of this hole. So I'm gonna take the floppy end of the spring and again, trying to work through a camera, through glasses. There we go, in. All right, so you're gonna end up with this right here, okay? And then you're gonna take this little notch right here and you look on the back of this and there's a hole. Quite simple. A lot. There, and should click. Once I can see it. Yeah, click. There you go. See that? All right. So now we can do a little function check and you're going to listen for that little ping. Ping. See how now with the spring in there, it does it automatically. So the gas is going to push on that piston, pop it back. Round's going to fly out and operate. Actually, stick with me a second. I do believe... Yeah. So okay. Yeah. So I was doing this off screen. Well, I'm. Uh, he's looking for a, a round to demonstrate with. I was doing this stuff off screen. Uh, literally, just getting in there. Just getting in there and polishing until uh, until all the wax goes away. Um, then it comes out looking very nice. The um, uh, yeah, it does work a little bit better um, with a heat gun. I was trying to find a spot to hook it up where it wasn't going to mess up the audio, but uh, with a heat gun, you can go ahead and sort of melt the wax um, on the wood, let it sit for a little bit, and then come back through and polish it off. And then um, after that second pass of uh, sort of, you get the you get the wax warm, you coat the gun. Uh, I like to give it a second pass with the heat gun to melt it all down, uh, make it smooth, and then you hit it with the um, 
uh, with the towel, whatever you want to, whatever you want to use to polish it after, and then it comes out looking pretty good. So, all right, so he's back. Go ahead. So we had talked about this being an intermediate cartridge and not being a full power rifle. 30 carbine round looks just like this. It is essentially just a 30 caliber pistol round, double length. So for extra power, and it fits into the magazine quite simply. Right, like so. So this would be inserted into the weapon, obviously. The, round, the uh, bolt would operate by stripping this off, chambering it, and firing it. Of course, this, I'm not gonna actually do it on camera because it's probably a no-no for Facebook. But that is your round, that's what it looks like. A lot different than your standard 30 caliber rifle round, which I forget the bring. Uh, like I said about the M2 carbine, they did have a larger magazine. You see the difference here? Give you the extra 15 rounds a go. All right, so we are ready to go back together. And what you're gonna do first is you're gonna put your recoil lug in. This is the piece that goes in the back of the stock. All right, and there's a screw for that, and this works into the corresponding hole in the bottom, right there. And correct screwdriver, please, sir. Let's see. All right. Trusty whacker. Might be a little wide. This is probably like how hard it is to use the Da Vinci machine for uh, surgery. <laughs> well, I think I was wondering like how hard that is it to do that. That screwdriver is a little too wide. That'd be right. I can get around it. Yeah, this, you ever seen that Da Vinci surgery machine where it's like you, you don't. They, they like put a headset on and like they, they, the robot does the surgery. So I'm like looking through glasses, looking through a screen, looking at my hands. So that's gotta be something somewhere. I was wondering like, how hard is it to screw that up? Oh, I just snipped that I shouldn't have. <laughs> how do you have any sense of depth perception? I guess it's probably 3D. All right. And that's in there. And so on this, there's a little lip underneath here and you're gonna take your action and you're gonna drop that whole thing in there until that little lip on the back of the receiver, right there, snaps in, okay? And the whole thing just falls into place. You can see here, oh my arms are getting tired. You can see here how the contours of the stock are the same as the contours of the op rod and how when it functions, it stays right in that groove, perfect. And then we have the upper hand guard I feel, like the, I feel like thing. Upper hand guard. Yep. And then there's a little lip on the back of that, a little notch, and that goes in this track right here. And boom, like that. On the front, there is this detent, and then that sits in this track on here. Click. And then that screwdriver again. All right, so there you have a fully reassembled, oiled correctly, waxed stock gun. Oh, huge. yeah, buck yeah. plate. Buck plate. <laughs> yeah, and that's why we don't like him, folks. Okay, buck plate. You can go ahead and do that, so. Gotcha, yep. There it is. All right, butt plate attached. Now, I guess I should probably do the sling. And I'm gonna heat myself in the morning for this because it's never go right. Okay, take the sling. And please folks, be gentle, I'm doing this with one hand. We are going to take the sling and set it in there already, just on one side. We're gonna take the oil bottle 
and push it in. And now we're going to, we're going to not put it in there. No, we're gonna move you magic this sucker. Yep. All right. Yeah, cause I just put it in there backwards. Of course. All right, we'll bottle back. Gotcha. Before you do this, go ahead and set the other side of this thing so that way you know you're not upside down. And we're gonna put this right there. Okay. And you got your buckle right here. Now, the appropriate way to do this, which never made sense to me because it goes through like this, is like so. It's harder to adjust this way and this taps against the stock and puts dings in it. However, this is what the manual shows. So you can do it that way or you can do it this way. Today we're gonna do it this way because that's just easier. We're going to put the sling back through the stock. Right there. And this is valuable life. This is a life lesson right here. Okay, flip it over. Oil bottle. Snap it in. Feed the feed this through here. And it is going to be tight. So I flip it over. See, it's almost there. Um, sometimes I will take something and jam it in there to try to get it through, but it seems like it's going to cooperate today. Amazing, nothing else I guess. Okay, I got it there. All right, so you're going to end up with this, okay? Oh, no! Why didn't you tell me? I couldn't see it from over there. Oh, my God. Make sure there's not a kink in the sling. And I thought I had to do it. Oh, man, I'm golden. <laughs> I'm in the five minutes of finishing. All right, there we go. Like that, no kink in the sling. Pull through, and that's gonna secure that in there. See that? Flip it over. Like I said, this is not the, in my opinion, the manual's opinion, because we all know the manual's never wrong. Correct way to do this, because then you end up with this little flap and loop on the outside. But this, in my opinion, makes it easier to adjust, because all you gotta do is stick your hand in here, and it gets, it gets tight. Now you got some parade, well, almost parade ready sling. There you go. And just give a little function check. I've already done that like 15 times, you know, it's good to go. So needs to wipe that off a little better. We can pass canceled again. So, function check. Clear, clear, let it go. Safety on, trigger, no fire. Trigger on, clear, clear, trigger, click. Magazine. Oh, it was thing you put in the pouch. There you go. Magazine, clear, clear. Um, the rounded edge goes to the front. The flat edge is on the back with the two teeth. No death perception. Right there. Click. And hopefully release. And that's it, folks. We have gone through all the way through it. If you have any questions about historic military firearms or the care, preservation, maintenance, or restoration of said such, by all means, you can message me directly. This is just a part of the museum here. We have dozens and dozens of weapons here that need constant maintenance. Even though it's been restored once, doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be constantly maintained. We recommend pulling everything you have out every six months, minimum, minimum, looking it over. Um, anything from a, putting an oily rag across it to actual detailed cleaning. Remember that dust, although you consider it to be dry, does contain minute amounts of humidity. And once dust sticks on something, the humidity is then transferred to the metal and that's what's going to cause active rusting. So dust is your enemy and rust never sleeps. Um, an oily gun is a happy gun. So this gun is, how old is that? 1943 to today. So that should be 80 years? Yeah. 80? Yeah. yeah, 80 years old. This right weapon on. is 80 years old. It's just as deadly as the day it came out and just as reliable as the day it came out. Um, these things are only going to be around so far as people care and maintain for them. They'll have a story to tell. Everything has a story to tell. And we are the stewards of said such. So you have to... Granddad gives you some kind of weapon or, or something is inherited. Remember, you're now responsible for taking care of it. The M1 carbine was a unique piece of American military firepower. It served the world over and it served in three wars from world war ii to korea to vietnam 
and it was, in my opinion, a Met Engineering Marvel, just like the M1 Grand. We'll do the M1 Grand at some other point and uh, take a look at that, and we'll go through all of them. 03 Springfield, 1917, even do 1919 and 1911. Um, next week coming up, we have another live stream video. We'll be detailing the life of the 1911 with Dave Hall, and that will be a good story not to miss. And as always, you can reach out and ask us a question at any one given time, and we will definitely get an answer for you if we can. So everyone have a good weekend. Thank you for tuning in. And like and subscribe, share this post, give us stars, do everything you can. We got a lot going on here, folks, and we're intending to just keep on going as long as we can. So please like and share. And um, again, reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you and have a good day.